Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Felons, friends, and freedom lovers, thank you so much for joining me for another edition of Felony Friday right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Felony Friday is the show where each and every week I focus on exposing injustice in the broken criminal justice system. And I have a really awesome guest lined up for you this week. You know, this has been a crazy week in politics, a crazy week, so much going on. I mean, there's been stuff with the new revelations from Senator Devin Nunes. The Trump's transition team was actually surveilled by the intelligence community last November, December, and January as they were transitioning. So I'm sure there's a lot more we're going to learn about that in the coming weeks. There's all the stuff going on with the Senate confirmation hearing for Judge Neil Gorsuch. Uh, That's normally covered on our Wednesday show, Electric Liberty Land with Brian McWilliams. And of course, there was the awful, terrible disturbing terror attack in London, right by Parliament. At the time of this recording, three were dead, 20 were wounded, just an awful thing. If you're hoping to hear me talk about any of those things on this show today, you're going to be disappointed because I'm not going to talk about any of it. On the other hand, if you're looking for sort of a, a respite, a break from that stuff, from the mainstream media's firestorm, the mainstream media's intent focus on those three topics then you're in the right place because I will give you that break today. Today on Felony Friday, I have an interview with Lenore Skenazy. And Lenore has been on Lions of Liberty before. She was on with Mark Clare about a year and a half ago. And if you've read Reason.com, then you're definitely familiar with her work. In fact, last week on Felony Friday, we actually talked about one of her pieces. Lenore's all about fighting for freedom. She's all about giving kids the breathing room to actually grow up and getting the government out of the way, out of your kid's life, and letting parents actually raise their kids. I had a lot of fun recording this. Lenore and I joked joked a lot back and forth. We talked about sporks. So if you have interest in sporks, this is the podcast for you. We're going to talk about that. Just two more notes before we get to this interview with Lenore. This is episode number 64 of Felony Friday, so you can find the show notes with links to everything that we're going to talk about, links to Lenore's books, links to her articles, links to her blog. You can find all that at lionsofliberty.com FF64. Also, next Monday on Lions of Liberty, Mark Clare is interviewing none other than Tom Woods. That's right, Tom Woods, Mr. Libertarian, the host of the Tom Woods Show, is coming on here, coming on Lions of Liberty for the second time. So you don't want to miss that. If you haven't already, subscribe to the Lions of Liberty podcast on iTunes or whatever your favorite podcasting app is. Subscribe so you don't miss that episode. And next Wednesday, of course, we'll have another episode of Electric Liberty Land with Brian McWilliams. Guys, if you love this show, some other ways you can help us out. You can check out lionsofliberty.com support for those ways. We have our Lions of Liberty Pride, which is a subscriber program. You can subscribe different amounts of money from $5 up to $25 or more if you want to. But at that $5 level, at that level, you will get access to exclusive content. And we released a blooper reel. We released a conspiracy roundtable. And this weekend, actually tomorrow, if you're listening to this on Friday... Tomorrow, I will be releasing a Felony Friday roundtable where myself and Mark Claire and Brian, we talked through some felonies trending in the news and we analyzed them and played Is This a Crime and Should Anyone Do Time for Those Felonies? So be sure to check that out. Also, as always, there is our Lions of Liberty store, our shirts that were designed by none other than Dan Smots. You can check those out at lionsofliberty.store. We have the shirts, we have the koozies. Check that all out. That's all I got. Let's get this show rolling. My guest today on Felony Friday is Lenore Skenazy. Lenore is a contributor to Reason.com. She is the author of the book Free Range Kids, How to Raise Safe, Self-Reliant Children Without Going Nuts with Worry. She also has a website by the same name where she provides commentary to her many fans out there who believe that our children are not in constant danger from creeps, kidnapping, germs, Grades, flashers, frustration, failure, baby snatchers, bugs, bullies, men, sleepovers, and or the perils of non-organic, of the non-organic grape. She just published a new book, 
and that's called Has the World Gone Skenazy? Love that title. It's uh, <laughs> thoughts on pop culture, pet peeves, and sporks. Lenore, welcome to Felony Friday. Why, thank you. Happy to be here, John. Thanks. Great to have you here. Great to have you back on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Uh, I think you were roar, last on here. Roar, hear me roar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lion of liberty. Yeah, <laughs> indeed you are. Back back on in November of 2015, I think that was episode 156. I can link to that in the show notes, and everyone can find that at lionsofliberty.com slash 156. But for those of our listeners out there who maybe – didn't hear that interview. We do have a, a larger audience now. Could you maybe we could start off by you giving a little bit of your little bit of your backstory, maybe how you got into being a uh, being for free range kids and, and what got you started and why you wanted to write that book in the first place. Oh, with pleasure. Uh, it was a million years ago already when our younger son was nine years old here in New York City. He started asking me and my husband if we would take him someplace he'd never been before and let him find his own way home on the subway. And uh, we decided to do it. Uh, one sunny Sunday, I took him to Bloomingdale's, really fancy schmancy department store, left him there uh, after explaining that that was the day. You know, it wasn't like he didn't know where I was. And um, I went home one way, and sure enough, he went home by the subway, and uh, then he had to take a bus across town. And uh, when he got into our apartment, he was levitating. He was outrageously proud that he had finally done something that he felt he was ready for and that we'd believed that he was ready for. So that's sort of the one-two punch. My parents believe in me, and what's more, now I'm part of the world. And so a couple months later, it didn't strike me as that big a deal when it happened, but a couple months later, I'm a newspaper columnist. I had nothing to write about. I wrote why I let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone. And two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, NPR, you name it, <laughs> and being described as America's worst mom. They were actually saying that to your face, or was uh, that? It became it became the the my moniker. Wow. I mean, it's it's straight. Google that phrase. I'm there for 77 Google pages, um, and so I started Free Range Kids um, the, the, that weekend. And thank God my husband was techy enough to figure out how to start a blog, um, because I wanted to say that I actually I love safety. I love helmets and car seats and seat belts. I, I I'm a nervous mom in many ways. But I do believe in strangers and I do believe in letting kids be part of the world. And that's something um, that has not only gone by the wayside, now can get you arrested <laughs> if you happen to trust your kid walking to school or taking public transportation or even playing on your front lawn. So, Lenore, as, as someone myself, I have an 18 month old daughter, uh, my wife and I. And um, like, like yourself, you know, I, I had a similar I had a childhood where. You know, I was allowed to explore. I was allowed to walk about a mile and a half to McDonald's with my friends mm -hmm. or walk up street mm -hmm. and get pizza. At lunch, mm -hmm. we could get a note from our parents and, and go out for lunch and go get pizza or whatever, whatever we wanted to get. Yeah, not, not, not anymore. Um, so in, in today's world, what kind of advice would you give someone like myself with you know, I'm trying to trying to raise my daughter to give her you know, the independence and the freedom to make mistakes and take risks, but, you know, also learn so she can learn from them. Um, mm -hmm. How can I do that and also not end up in prison? Well, first of all, as the person who chronicles every incident, I'd say in America, uh, when parents are getting uh, arrested or even chided for letting their kids have any independence, you won't end up in prison. Uh, it's it's the rarest of outcomes. And it, it's, thank God, it, it usually doesn't happen. The problem is you shouldn't have to worry about this at all. It should not be up to the government to decide when your child is old enough to walk outside or learn how to cross the street or ride a bike. These have always been the decisions made by parents looking at their kids their, as individuals and looking at their neighborhoods and thinking what makes sense. So there's, there's a couple of fronts that I'm working on. One is to try to bring more kids back outside so that it doesn't seem unusual. People don't call 911 uh, to say there's a child on the sidewalk if there are a bunch of children on the sidewalk and everybody's walking to school. So, you know, my, my main purpose is to renormalize the idea of children having some uns unsupervised time. But the other front that I'm fighting is to make sure that it, there's no way that the government has a chance to arrest a parent for believing in their kids and their communities. And to that end, I'm trying to get towns and then states and eventually the federal government to pass what I call the Free Range Kids and Parents Bill of Rights, which 
um, since I'm a tabloid reporter and not a lawyer, is just one sentence long. And it goes like this. It says, our children have the right to some unsupervised time and we have the right to give it to them without getting arrested. And if your town passes that, uh, which doesn't seem like it's a controversial thing to pass because you're not saying we believe in parents beating their children or Mm -hmm. starving them or pimping them out. It's simply we believe that a parent knows that their six-year-old is ready to walk down the block and knock on their friend's door. And it doesn't take away from the cop's job. If, if a child is truly endangered or if, a, or if a parent is truly abusive, the cops should rush in. And similarly, so should Child Protective Services. But if a cop think, but if a, if a parent thinks, you know, it's my two kids, they're walking home from the park today, it's a beautiful day, I'm going to go home first, and they know how to cross the street, and they know not to get in the car with anybody, um, you know, we should be... Con- not congratulating them, but certainly hands off from those parents who are treating their children as the same competent people that our parents treated us like. When I was a kid, I was walking to school at five and there was a crossing guard and the crossing guard was 10. And this was not unusual. And and the crime rate was higher. We're at a 50 year crime low now. So if we weren't arresting parents back then, why would we be arresting parents now when the crime rate is lower? 100% 100% agree with you. And it's it's kind of worrisome to think what kind of culture we're, we're creating by raising children like this. What, what What's our culture going to be like in 10, 20, 50 years? You know, you're going to have a culture yeah. of people that are, are insulated in, in little bubbles, afraid to step out of them and interact with society around them. Well, some would argue that we are already seeing that culture on college campuses. Uh, you know, there have been all these incidents recently of students who feel they need a safe space uh, when a speaker comes to speak at their college whom they don't agree with. And the most egregious, and there have been a lot of examples, but but the one that's sort of the touchstone is the uh, there was a speaker who was coming to Brown University, it's an Ivy League place, who was talking about, I can't remember if it was abortion or quote unquote rape culture. I can't even remember what the topic was. But students who didn't, who felt uncomfortable with this topic rather than avoiding it or sitting in the audience and raising their hands afterwards and and asking questions and making objections, instead were given a safe room as if this was the nuclear bomb going off (laughs) where they could go and in the room, I, I don't know if it was sealed or not, but within the room they would have a video of puppies to watch. There was cookies and milk. There were, um, uh, coloring books. And the the image obviously is one of preschool. <laughs> and you could argue that perhaps there's a line from kids not being allowed to walk to school, to play a game after school with their friends and argue about whether the ball was in or out or should we play football or, or tag and decide to, to throw it a little softer to the, to the little kid and harder to the big kid and deal with the bully. If we, if you've taken all these everyday experiences out of kids' lives where they learn to, to, to deal with some harsh words and to roll with some punches and to, you know, to be frustrated because they didn't win or were playing a different game instead, rather than always having an adult intermediary there to say the ball was out, we're playing this game, it's time for a snack. If you don't have any experience sort of dealing with the everyday sturm und drang of interacting with other people, you get perhaps what we're seeing on college campus, which is kids feeling literally afraid and unsafe in what is literally a safe situation. It's just words after all. But if you've been told that nothing is safe enough, they can't deal with anything, it's all too unsafe, even walking home from school, even waiting in the car for a few minutes, being a latchkey kid, if it's all too unsafe, they don't they don't know the difference between safe and unsafe, and everything strikes them as overwhelming and scary. And it can cause, like we saw, you were talking about the case at, at Brown, there was recently, I don't know if it was before or after, but with uh, Milo uh, Yiannopoulos. Yeah, Milo, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Milo, yeah, out Berkeley. In, uh, in Berkeley, mm-hmm. in California, mm-hmm. where... It wasn't, you know, the kids weren't, they didn't have their safe spaces they were retreating to. It was violence in the street and just destroying property, throwing firebombs and just just some really despicable stuff. So that was, however, uh, there's some evidence that that wasn't really students, that that was organized by people beyond the campus. But I'll tell you, the, the most recent one that is 
resonant for us is up at Middlebury College, a man named Charles Murray, who wrote The Bell Curve and has done a lot of other scholarly research since then, but is considered uh, by some to be a racist because the book talked about whether there was a genetic difference, a genetic inferiority, intellectual inferiority in blacks versus whites. And students there, rather than listening to him and asking questions or bringing up other studies that disprove it or whatever, instead they started a riot. And in the end, they, they, uh, Charles Murray and the woman who was going, the professor who was going to interview him and who was not on his side, uh, they both had to escape in a car, but not before somebody grabbed the woman and wrenched her to the point where she had to go to the hospital and she had a concussion and her, she emerged with her neck and a neck brace. And this is a college where, you know, liberal arts is supposed to be studying all sorts of ideas as opposed to not only sticking your fingers in your ears when you don't like an idea, but wrenching a woman's neck when you don't like an idea. That doesn't strike me as very open-minded. No, it certainly doesn't. And, and equally important is learning how to counter those those ideas that, that are dangerous and form good arguments so, mm-hmm. so you can convince people not to follow and not to not to comply right. with those ideas. Right, because I'm not saying that everybody should agree with every speaker that comes on right. campus. But, but if you've been told that arguing is mean or sticking up for what you believe makes another person feel less something or other, if everything is couched in terms of the other person is so fragile that anything you do or say or imply is going to hurt them possibly forever, uh, then you start shutting up and then maybe you internalize it too. Maybe you start thinking like, wow, if I hear something bad, I'll be hurt forever. And that's when you start getting this sort of equivalency between the, we used to say sticks and stones can break your bones, but names will never hurt me. But now names and words are in the same category as sticks and stones. They're all treated as uh, very violent. And, of course, you need a safe space to protect yourself from real violence. But there's this equivalency now between words and ideas I don't agree with and literally being physically hurt. And it's, a, it's strange. And I think it's because... We really are in almost a a cult of safety at this point. And I say this once again as somebody who loves safety and uh, I'm scared of cars and I look both ways and I wave my arms when I cross the street. I'm practically insane on the (laughs) on Mm -hmm. when it comes to safety, but I'm not afraid of terrible ideas. My mom ended up in the the last place she lived was Skokie and uh, we're Jewish. That's where the Nazis marched. And I can't say I love the Nazis, but I do love the ACLU for saying yeah, March, because the more people hear about you, the more they're going to think you're crazy. Right. Yeah, it, it really is a sort of a, a fascinating phenomenon to look at. And, you know, maybe 50, 100 years from now, people will look back on this and kind of <laughs> analyze, try to figure out what the heck was going on and why we kind of went down this this path in, in American higher education and, and even just raising our children in, in this manner. But I do want to kind of pivot for one minute here. And then I do mm-hmm. want to come back and talk about some of your, your reason articles that you've, some of the articles you've written reason, recently for reason.com. But first mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you about your new book. I know you've, you've been oh. touring around the country mm-hmm. and it's like I said, in the intro, it's called has the world gone skinazy thoughts on pop culture, pet peeves, and sporks. So yes. was, is this is this a uh, sort of a, a, a respite from uh, <laughs> diving into this, the issue with yes, the free range yes, kids? Or I, is you, it know, related? There's, uh, you know, there's a couple of free range kids pieces in there, but mostly it's just stuff that interests me. I, I, I wonder, like, whatever happened to I'm fascinated by advertising and I feel bad that in the olden days when I was growing up, there was the Maytag repairman, there was the Dunkin' Donuts guy, there was Madge, there was the the bounty lady with the quicker picker upper. And how come you don't have like any middle-aged schlubs pitching for products anymore? Now you have to be a celebrity or somebody kind of hip or cool. So that's just one of the things I look into. I looked into sporks because it's the only cutlery that was ever invented in America. And the only two places where you'll, three places, you'll see them um, all the time are Kentucky Fried Chicken, prison, and school, (laughs) public school. So there's something interesting about that. I I, I wandered around Petco sort of angry that I wasn't a dog because they get all these great things. They get (laughs) T- tick collars that so you don't have to worry about ticks in the summer we we're in the country up here and we worry about ticks and they have 
gravy that you put on any food and it makes it all taste like roast beef, which I would love. And you don't have to get into a real shower. You can shower with this little the wipey thing that wipes you off. So uh, they have chew toys, absolutely no calories. You just chew a chew toy. It's better than gum. So I just sort of wander around going, hmm, this is so weird. Hmm, this is so weird. Victoria's Secret the Victoria's Secret CEO was worried that they'd gotten too sexy. And I actually had to agree with her. They sort of ended up branding everything with XOXO and lips on it. And it just got to be, you know, there's nothing sexy about somebody screaming, I'm sexy. Look at me. You know, there's, there's a frisson of mystery that adds a little something that Victoria's Secret has completely lost. So I feel like I'm just sort of a curious person who wanders around <laughs> the retail environment and elsewhere going, how come this is going on? Uh, so that's it. Okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break now to hear from our sponsors. After this break, we're going to talk about sporks, you know, part spoon, part fork, a spork. So definitely stick around for that. Hey guys, this is Roger Paxton, and if you're fed up with the government running every single aspect of your life, but you're not listening to the Lava Flow podcast yet, then what's wrong with you? Check us out at thelavaflow.com, or just go back to sucking up to the government. The Lava Flow podcast, striking the root every single episode. This is Chris Spangle, and I am the host of We Are Libertarians, which you can find in iTunes, Google Play, or at wearelibertarians.com. We are a podcast that brings you all of the irreverence that modern politics deserves by examining current events from a libertarian perspective. So please, check us out at wearelibertarians.com. Hey everyone, the Johnny Rocket Launchpad is Liberty. Each week we strive to bring you the best guests in talk radio. The Johnny Rocket Launchpad delivers weekly interviews of noteworthy politicians, experts, and activists. The Johnny Rocket Launchpad is bringing the party to the Libertarian Party and launching ideas in your direction. Check us out at johnnyrocketlaunchpad.com. You can hear me, Kurt Nelson, and the beautiful Heather Nixon talk about the ideas of liberty, rock and roll. Where, where do the sporks come in? Because just just a quick yeah. just a quick story here. Well, I remember when I was in high school, we had a we had a game that we played, and it was called the the spork game. And what it was mm-hmm. is we, we got a, a lot of this, a lot of the senior class at the time participated, and the game was you had to have a spork with you at all times. <laughs> if you didn't, if you put your spork down to you know pick up a book or something or or do something <laughs> else, or if you're playing sports. And then someone mm-hmm. else had their spork with them. They could spork you. Then you were out of the game. And That's a fantastic game. <laughs> That's so wacky. Probably wow. kids today would probably wouldn't allow it in schools today. It might get hurt well, with a spork. Still allowed sporks. They're probably like rounded edged sporks these days. Which yeah. <laughs> uh, sparks were already really hard to eat with because they didn't have enough depth for them to work as a fork. And yet there's there's holes in them, so they're a pretty terrible spoon. But uh, I love that idea because it's so. Uh, all encompassing. You could look for somebody in the library. You could look for somebody walking home from school, and if they don't have their spork, and yet it's a spork. Right. You know, it's not. It's not a, a ginsu knife. It's. It sounds like a great game, and it, it, I'm going to recommend it at my next school talk. And, and I, I don't know if I'd recommend this last part, but my best friend ended up winning for for the whole grade, and the way that he won, mm-hmm. I helped him out. Is he knew that the uh-huh. there were two people left, a a, a girl and and my friend, and she was flying out of the country with her family. And he went mm-hmm. to the airport <laughs> and waited until she was sitting at the gate. This was back in the day when you could still just walk back oh, if you didn't have uh-huh. a pass. There's no TSA back then, you know, right, right. patting you down. Walk back there, waited for her to put her spork down, and sporked her right there before she got on the plane. <laughs> so pretty, pretty so epic. She put really. the, that's, yeah. Well, I think that that's actually touching on something, believe it or not, that I want to talk about, which sure. is that when kids <laughs> have – when kids have unstructured time, when they're allowed with something as crazy, and I, I don't know of anyone else who did this, so it might just be your game as the spork game, and then sit there and collude and figure out, wait a minute, she's going out of town. How am I going to get to the airport? I don't have a car. I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to do that. I have to go to her gate, but she can't see me when I'm there, and so I have to hide. All that stuff is so vital in terms of learning how the world works and making your way in it. I mean, you've figured out transportation, you've figured out scheduling, you've figured out subterfuge, uh, the will to win and no taking no prisoners. I mean, all that stuff is fantastic uh, education. I mean, look at the focus. 
that that required for your friend to figure out, okay, if she's going out of town and this is the plane, I got to get to the gate. That's more focused than probably he or you spent on most of your English assignments. (laughs) I would guarantee you it was a lot more. (laughs) And, and yet we, we keep taking these, these opportunities out of kids' lives and replacing them with supervised activities. I have a friend, Peter Gray, who wrote the book Free to Learn, uh, which I just love. It's like my favorite book. And it's all about how when you turn learning into work, which is what school does, then most kids are like the rest of us. You try to get done with work as quickly and painlessly as you can. Just get it done, right? But if you're doing something that is interesting to you, which this sport game obviously was, Maybe that's why you even called me today, because there's the word spork in my book. (laughs) Who knows? Um, Then you are focusing and you're learning and you're reading a schedule and you're figuring out your your, uh, approach. And this is the kind of thing we want to see developed in kids. We want them to be able to focus. We want them to be able to come up with a plan and do something long term. And even executive, sorry, I just hit the mic. Executive function is what they call being able to hold it together for long enough to get something done. And for kids, that's really hard. In class, that's why everybody shoots rubber bands and chews gum and Mm -hmm. whatever else and and hides sporks. But but when you're playing, you love playing so much that you do hold it together. And that is when you get practice being mature and practicing this executive function. So to have school let out at 3 and at 3.05, you're in math tutoring and then comes Mandarin and then there's piano and then there's soccer league. And on the weekends, you're in the SUV being taken from one travel game to another and everything is supervised. You don't have a chance to do anything as wacky, wild and frankly grown up as grabbing your friend at, at the plane. Yeah, I, I don't know how you did this, but you managed to take my ridiculous sports story <laughs> and turn it turn it into a profound point. So that was that was really yeah, incredible. three profound points if it's a sport. Actually, four, right? Don't they have four? All right, but, but the point is that that it it never sounds like it's profound to say give your kids some free time, or for God's mm-hmm. sake, let them come up with a dumb game and explain it to his friends and get some buy in. It sounds like a waste of time compared to Mandarin or coding class, and so. I feel like, you know, it does require a little elegy sometimes to to point out to people that the thing they loved most from their childhood, this this creativity and the free time and the playing with friends and coming up with something to do was not wasted time. It's not like now kids are doing something with their time. We just wasted it. You didn't waste it. And what we've been worrying about for the first half of this discussion was what happens when kids have no free time and they don't learn how to manage the executive function, hold it together if they're upset. What happens? They need a safe space. Exactly. I, I do want to talk. I don't. I don't want to spend the whole show talking about sporks. I do want to talk don't? about some of. Right. You I have guess that, that'll a, be spork today. Your next show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tune you, you have written a, a lot of uh, great articles recently. Um, touching on some pretty pretty important topics at Reason.com. We actually talked about one of them on last week's show. What? It was your article, the the 20-year-old who was deported for sex with a 16-year-old. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, Our sex offender which, laws are insane. They are insane. And I finally crunched the numbers, and I have to go find them again. But I, I think it's more likely that you're, certainly if you have a son, that your child will end up on the sex offender registry then be molested by someone on it. It's it's just this burgeoning list of people that we assume every wow. time anybody's labeled a sex offender, they're a horrible predator. They're going to hop out from the bushes near the, the bus stop. But in fact, you can get on the sex offender registry for so many ridiculous things, including that 20-year-old with a 16-year-old girlfriend or mm-hmm. public urination or streaking or going to a prostitute. And while the recidivism rate, everybody thinks like, oh, they're incorrigible and they can't stop. And the the minute you're on that, thank God you're on that list because these are the people we really have to watch out for. And in fact, uh, the recidivism rate is about 5%, which is pretty low. It's actually the lowest criminal, um, you know, recriminalization rate other than murderers. And, And when you start looking at a list of sex offenders somewhere in the neighborhood and being scared of them, you're, you're looking in the wrong direction <laughs> because the vast majority of crimes against children occur at the hands of somebody that they know. It's uh, you know, the relative or a coach or a family friend. And so mm-hmm. we've made pariahs out of people who generally don't reoffend, and we're looking for them and forgetting that the best way to keep your kids safe 
is to teach them what I teach everybody who looks at my blog, the three R's. Recognize, no one can touch you where your bathing suit covers. Resist, yell, kick, scream, and report. Tell me, your mom or your dad, um, if anybody's making you feel weird or telling you not to, you know, to keep a secret because that way you're taking away the molester's greatest asset, which is silence. So those things, recognize, resist, and report, are going to keep your kid not perfectly safe, nothing does, but a whole lot safer than saying, oh my God, there's a sex offender in the neighborhood, you have to walk around that block. Doesn't matter. At least you're giving them practical practical tools that they can you know, alert someone to actually get help and know it's okay to ask for help. I think that's, that's, that's mm-hmm. equally important. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, it's okay to, to scream and get the heck out of there. You bet. I wanted to ask you about a couple of these stories. There was one that, so this is the court, court sentences dad to hard labor <laughs> for making his eight-year-old son walk a mile as punishment. Yeah, I was just talking um, about this. I think this, that this one took place, I think, in Riverside, California. Yes, is it did. Right? Yes. Uh, okay. I actually used to live there for, for a little, little Oh, so, so tell me about it. What's Riverside like? It's, uh, I would say it's very, it's sort of a diverse area mm-hmm. in that you can, it's, it's mostly, mostly very nice, mostly built up, uh, newer developments, townhomes, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. apartment buildings, things like that. Um, but it does, it does have some shady areas mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not sure exactly where this took place, but. I don't know either. It was in front of I, some, yeah. um, shopping center. So here's the deal. This dad's at his wits end. His eight year old son is supposed to have done his homework. He didn't do his homework. The dad has tried giving him timeouts. He tried giving him, I can't remember. Oh, he took away his game boy or something like that. And so this night he says, look at, if you're not going to do your homework, uh, you're going to end up homeless and I'm going to take you where the homeless people are. So he drives him to the local shopping center, which, uh, for the record, didn't have any homeless people there that evening, and which is on the boy's normal route home from school. So he knows this route very well, and he knows to cross at the crossing uh, section. And the dad leaves him there. And, of course, once again, we have a child outside by himself. This has become so unusual a sight that people automatically assume it's dangerous. And so somebody calls 911, four cop cars come, which to me indicates a certain need for some excitement in the life of the cops. And by this time, they, 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 they put the kid in the cop car. And a few minutes later, the dad comes by because he's wondering, where's his dad? And I, where's his son? And maybe he was feeling a little remorse for leaving him there. And he's arrested and thrown in jail. And he decides to go for a jury trial uh, because he feels he has the, um, I, he feels he was right. He's the one who gets to determine how to discipline and raise his child. There's no curfew until 10 o'clock at night. This was eight o'clock at night. Uh, it was not freezing cold out cause it's Southern California. His son well, knows free, the route. Freezing cold in Southern California is 60 degrees. Yeah, right. Oh, maybe it was <laughs> freezing cold then. Maybe it was freezing cold by those standards. I grew up in Chicago. Uh, and and anyway, so the boy knows the route, knows to cross at the cross at the at the light, and that was it. He was starting home. And in fact, the boy was starting home when the cops stopped him. And so the jury found him guilty after listening to the cops say that I wouldn't even let my twenty year old ever walk home from anywhere. Nothing is safe enough. And the the dad was kind of apoplectic, saying, well, are you going to trust a cop who says nothing is safe enough, not even letting his 20-year-old, you know, old enough to go to Afghanistan and be shot by the mm-hmm. Taliban, but he's not going to let his 20-year-old walk home from the Dunkin' Donuts, and you're uh, you're going to listen to him or you're going to listen to me who loves my child so much and was just trying to help him? Sometimes you have a bad parenting day. Sometimes you have a, a parenting method that I wouldn't do, that you would do. Would I give my kid a time out? Would I take away dessert? What However, he was found guilty and sentenced to 56 days of hard labor, and he's not doing them, and now he expects to be thrown in jail or something like that, something that he's willing to do, he says, because nobody stands up for these uh, against the, the cops and the, the laws that are taking away our freedom as parents to raise our children the way we see fit. And I really wouldn't have done what he did, I don't think, but I don't think it was dangerous. I think it's just so unusual that we've recalibrated what we think of as, as unusual. We now think of as dangerous because I don't, you know, my kids didn't walk home at age eight. Now nobody should walk home at age eight, but I walked home at age eight. So it's, we've forgotten that it is normal for a child to be outside, for a child to walk a mile, 
for a parent to be frustrated. These are all normal things, but um, we've criminalized them. And, and I think he's he's right to be apoplectic. And it's it's gotten to the point where parents have become really obsessed with knowing where their kids are at all times That's or giving their kids point. cell phones mm-hmm. when they're five years old. Mm-hmm. So it's it's okay to not know where your kid is. Well, it I is mean, it is okay now. But one of the things that I worry about is with the ease and cheapness and con- and availability of all these tracking devices, whether it's a cell phone or a GPS device or an RFID thing. There's RFID tags that kids wear in some places as they get on the bus, so the bus can register your child is on the bus, and then your child is off the bus. Uh, when it becomes so easy and normal to keep constant track of your kid, I worry that it's going to become illegal not to. And if we go back to the thing we were talking about, the sporks, you know, chances are when your friend went off to the airport, he didn't say, mom, I'm going five miles to the airport to, you know, to sabotage my, my buddy as she gets on a plane and take away her spork. And that's okay. I mean, we really have, have just the availability, the, the ability to be in constant touch with our kids and constantly watch them has not made us give them more freedom because now we can see where they are. It's going to be okay. It's given them less because we're constant. Oh my God, why is he crossing that street? Why is she there? How I'll call her. Are you coming home, honey? Why did you walk a block out of your normal way home? Oh, I wouldn't follow a dog if I were you here. Show me a picture. It's just, it's, it's the umbilical cord. And if you're, mm-hmm. if you have the world's longest umbilical cord, it's hard to cut it. <laughs> and, and yet what, do, you know, what is the job of parents? It is not to be, not to raise a fetus. It's to raise a, a functioning person. And we're encouraged every step of the way, not to let them develop all that, all the, the know-how and maturity that we did. We're encouraged to substitute our own, like outsource our genius adultness to our kids. And that's taking away the opportunity for them to become these genius adults. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And just to touch on to touch on one more thing, one more aspect of of, of this culture of parents always knowing where their kids are. Mm-hmm. On Mark Clare's show, he interviewed Zoltan Istvan, who is an advocate for transhumanism. He actually founded the Transhumanist Party. And he actually has a chip voluntarily <laughs> implanted in his hand. Um, which is able to do several things. One of the, the weird things I remember is it can actually send a text message when you when you shake someone's hand. It can you know you can introduce yourself. But along that along those lines though, we, we have to be you know we have to be cognizant. We can't let government you know make us put chips in our kids to keep track of them because at that point right. you've you've lost all sense of our autonomy. Freedom, really. Right, right, and, right. No, know, that's what I do worry about. I worry about a a, a society that grows up, kids growing up thinking that only constant surveillance is it not only is it normal they're probably not safe without it if they feel naked like how come there's nobody watching me on a on a map somewhere with a gps then who who's going to say hey big brother <laughs> i'm putting a you know i'm putting something in front of that lens i mean you just you start believing that you need surveillance to be safe absolutely um, Lenore, I, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I want to give you some time now so you can so you can plug what you're working on, um, plug and let everyone know where they can find your new book, where they can oh, find you on social media. Okay, well, um, an easy way to find me is if you Google Free Range Kids, because Free Range Kids is the blog, Free Range Kids is the Twitter feed, and Free Range Kids is one of my books. And the other book, the one that's out now that's a little more far-ranging, I don't even want to use the word ranging anymore. Funnier. Let's just say it's funnier, although Free Range Kids <laughs> is funny too. The the wacky book is Has the World Gone Skenazy? You don't even have to world you don't have to spell skenazy, but I'll spell it for you anyway. S K E N A Z. And that's on Amazon. Um, and I'm also at Reason. And if you go to Reason and there's an article about how terrible our sex offender laws are, it's either by me or gall darn it. Jacob Sullum has gotten to it before me, or Elizabeth Nolan Brown, two of my fantastic colleagues. We're always fighting for these. And if it's one about uh, what's what's wacky that's happening on campus, that's Robbie Suave, who is my editor, I'm proud to say. So Reason.com, FreeRangeKids.com, and has the world gone skenazy? And plug is over. Oh, wait. 
wait, one more plug. What do I do for a living? <laughs> I blog for free. So if you need a speaker, hilariously funny speaker, um, that's what I do. I go around the country giving speeches. I've spoken at Microsoft, at Yale, at Cliff Bar, at the Sydney Opera House, at the Bulgarian Happiness Festival, weird places, and a ton of PTAs and companies. So if you go to freerangekids.com and you click on Have Lenore Speak, <laughs> pretty obvious, um, you can have Lenore Speak. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was really fun. Oh, thank you so much. You know, we're 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 leaving each other now, and I had I just you'll call me back sometime, and I'll tell you what's happening in Scotland, which will make your readers, I guess, your listeners quake. I'll bet you guys want to hear now what Lenore had to share about Scotland. Guess what? I couldn't wait, so I kept Lenore on the line, and she told me about it, and I'm going to be releasing it tomorrow. It's only going to be released to our Lions Pride subscribers. So for a simple monthly contribution of five, ten, or twenty-five dollars a month, you will get access to all of our exclusive content, including um, what Lenore is going to talk about, what's going on in Scotland, and with that, tomorrow I'm going to release our Felony Friday roundtable discussion that we had, that I had with Mark Clare and Brian, Brian McWilliams where we talked about some felonies trending in the news. One of the ones we talked about was one that was talked about in the Lions of Liberty forum recently, where police officers responded to a security alarm at a marijuana dispensary in Michigan, and one police officer got impaled in the feet. So we analyzed that one and gave it a grade if we thought it was a crime and if anyone involved there should do time. So you guys definitely want to check that out once again. You can get access to all of our exclusive content by going to lionsofliberty.com slash support. I'm not going to hassle you guys anymore. No fancy outro today. I got nothing to rant about. Just go to lionsofliberty.com slash support if you want more content. That's all I have for today's show. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. We really do appreciate you guys out there sharing the show and everything you do for us. We appreciate all of our subscribers. We love you guys. Keep it up. We'll keep it up here. This is John Odermatt signing off. Always remember to keep your head up and the fire is liberty burning.